Hey, what's happening guys? Mike Moo here. And I often get asked a lot by many of my friends whenever I'm taking pictures. Hey Mike, what kind of camera do you use? You know, does it really matter? And usually I have to tell them what matters more important is your skill and whether or not you make use best use of what you have at the time, whether it's a smartphone, whether it's a DSLR, whether it's one of these mirrorless ones. But if I had to choose one camera right now, and today is, uh, it's almost February 2018th right now, um, it would definitely be the Sony RX10 Mark IV. Now, why is that? Well, this pretty much covers just about anything any non-professional or even some professional shooters need to cover at any given moment in time without compromise. And I'm not sponsored or endorsed by Sony or any of the companies that I mentioned. However, I will have affiliate links down below of this video down in the comments below in case you wanna check out any of the equipment, I get a little small percentage. Uh, with that said, the main reason why this camera, outside of all the other cameras available uh, on the market right now, is that this is a one-stop solution. This will handle just about everything well. Exceedingly better than you can possibly do on a smartphone because the lens is incredible. It is absolutely incredible. Super, super duper sharp. And that's really, whenever you're buying equipment, if you're just looking at the equipment side of things, the lens is what you wanna spend the most amount of money on. This Carl Zeiss lens is absolutely amazing. It's a Vario Sonar T-Star 72 uh, millimeter filter thread um, over there in front. It's got a, a aperture of 2.4 uh, to four across the zoom range. 24 to 600 millimeter equivalent on 35 millimeter format. Um, this is practically the size of a standard DSLR. So if you look at any standard Canon, uh, maybe entry level or mid level DSLR, this is kind of what you're looking at in terms of size and form factor. So right here, this is what it looks like at 24 millimeters. And then when you zoom in, this is what happens at 600 millimeters. You'll see it is quite a bit larger, but if you're trying to look at the equivalent of something like this compared to something that is even, let's just say APS-C size sensors or a larger sensor, you're looking at a significantly bigger package, including the camera body and the lens, and also more expensive. Now, before we get any further, there's a couple of main things besides the size, if this size isn't gonna work out for you as your only camera, is that you need to factor in the very fact that this guy is actually $1,700. That's right, it's $1,700. Let me tell you, it's worth every single penny of it. $1,698 right now, as you can see on Amazon. Um, it, is, it was, at the beginning, when it was available, often out of stock. And now, of course, it is in stock. There's only eight left available at this time. And it is, the what sets this apart from the previous versions, as you can see, it's a Sony Cybershot RX10 Mark IV, is that it really has super amazing fast autofocus acquisition speed. The phase detection on this is amazing. So if you wanna capture your kids running around, zoom or on the sports, um, outdoors during the daytime, this is absolutely remarkable. This takes some of the best technologies that Sony has available uh, at this time and puts it all into this package for this $1,700 price point. It's got optical image stabilization just like all the other major Sony cameras available. 315 phase detection AF points. These are all technical details. Just know that these are very, very, very impressive numbers. And then you got the lens. It's got a 20.1 megapixel, one inch back illuminated uh, Exmor RS stack CMOS sensor. This is basically the best in the industry. There is no better one inch sensor on the market right now. And that's because a lot of the Sony, uh, a lot of the one inch sensors out there are all produced by Sony. Um, all these other camera manufacturers, they actually license or purchase the rights in order to put their amazing sensors into the cameras themselves. So this is no exception. This is, of course, Sony's latest. It's got the processing speed of their $4,000 camera, which is the Sony Alpha 9, uh, put into, the, into this camera. 
and then put a, an amazing lens right on there and their autofocusing system and put it all right in here. And with the zoom range, you cover just about everything. So that, that pretty much um, answers why this is, if you're looking at just, just one single camera, if, if you're starting out and you're not invested in any system at all, whether it's Sony, Canon, interchangeable, none of that. If you're just looking at it right now, only one camera, this one would be it. The only two major points, again, are the price at $1,700 and also the size of it. So this actually weighs, let's take a look at the, uh, the details here. This actually weighs, and I'm pulling directly from, you know, some of the review sites. If you wanna go into a lot more technical details, these other sites, uh, imagingresource.com, DP Review, of course, go into the, the main nitty gritty details uh, about the, the, Sonar, uh, the, the Sony RX10 Mark IV. So this weighs uh, 38.6 ounces. Uh, that is really, um, you know, it's it's not something super lightweight and pocketable. If you're looking for a pocketable, if you're looking for a pocketable unit, um, you can get the Sony RX100 Mark V, which has very similar fast autofocus performance and very similar performance. Not quite at this level, but still um, right on, right on up there. So ever since I've been getting, ever I, I own a lot of cameras. And since, since I've gotten the RX10 Mark IV, I've actually been doing quite a bit of traveling. I've taken this over to CES, and I've brought other cameras with me, including the Sony Alpha 6500, which I'm using to film right now up there. And I've just never, ever needed to bring that out. I mean, it was cumbersome. The battery life is not that great on it, especially shooting in 4K versus this guy, actually one battery actually works out for me for shooting just about the whole day, but I would actually bring two depending on how many shots uh, that you plan on doing um, when you're out and about. It's extremely comfortable to hold. It's very ergonomic. Uh, it, it fits my hands pretty well and I got fairly large hands. It's got a built-in flash, which was actually useful last night when I was shooting uh, some family that was coming in and we shot in front of the Bellagio, and the pictures actually turn out pretty well with the built-in flash. It's got the standard hot shoe. It's actually really great for 4K video recording as well. Uh, it, besides, besides having the headphone jack and the microphone jack, it's got clean HDMI output if you want, records internally at 4K. It's got a flip-out screen that is useful, but not for the selfie parts, so you'll still need a, st if, if, you, if you're recording vlogs and something, this probably isn't the best camera for you to use in that case. You might want to check out some of my other videos for the uh, vlogging equipment. I have a whole uh, playlist. It's got amazing eye viewfinder. It's got a touch screen here, which allows you to uh, focus pretty well. So that's something that sets it apart from the Mark III. Same lens as the Mark III, which is the previous version, but the autofocus and the processing speed is absolutely remarkable. Shoots up to 24 frames per second with focus. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty remarkable. Uh, lens is, is the same, it's just as sharp. And uh, you know you can see the LCD screen on here, which is actually really useful. Usually you don't see this on um, any cameras that are not, uh, not mid to high uh, pro grade. It's got a bunch of custom function buttons on here and everything. I love the EVF dial. The EVF dial is absolutely, not the EVF dial, but the EV compensation dial here. Let's uh, try to get a little bit of focus uh, on here. So the EVF focus thing is pretty useful. In fact, as a pro, oftentimes I shoot in manual or aperture or shutter priority. Uh, with this, I find it really liberating to just use, just like on my Fuji camera, the uh, exposure compensation dial. So if you just need to lighten it up or darken it up, you could just rotate this dial. And I've often set it just in a P or automatic mode for a lot of my outdoor adventure shooting. And it's worked out pretty well. One thing that's not mentioned a whole lot is the built-in microphones, actually pretty good. There's, there's the two records in stereo. It's, it's actually surprisingly good for environmental uh, videos. Definitely not gonna be as good as a, as a shotgun base, but um, out and about, if you don't happen to have a microphone stuck on top of it through the microphone jack input, it actually works out, you know, okay. It actually sounds pretty good. So I'm, I'm extremely impressed with this, and I can't recommend this uh, e enough. Uh, I do have some recommended accessories that you want to might maybe consider getting. So 
One of them is you, you'll want to get a screen uh, protector in the back. This guy, is, this is actually pretty fairly prone to scratches. Unfortunately, that's just the fact of it. And I didn't have a screen on here, so I had some really light scratches just from light use. The other thing is that this does not have a built-in ND filter, so it, if you are going to be recording videos, uh, as we all know, you want to keep the frame rates relatively close to what you anticipate. Uh, to be recording in, you'll need a second ND filter, and there's really no way, uh, uh, there's no in built in uh, ND filter like they had did in the uh, early versions of the Sony RX10 or even some of the competitors, such as the Panasonic FC2500. So, so I'll link up uh, some, uh, some uh, ND filters that you can recommend. Sony makes their own as well. Um, so, I'd, I'd recommend you consider that. I get, often get asked a lot what the heck these things are, and these are by Peak Design. And this allows me to easily attach a camera strap on or off easily. So I'll also have a link down below on that. And then I have a custom SLR uh, soft shutter button on here. This just this just a nice little accessory for me to easily uh, be able to reduce reduce the shake that I have when pressing the button, and also for me to make sure that I know where it is without having to keep my take my eye off of the eye viewfinder or this uh, down below. So th these are some simple accessories that I have uh, stuck on here. The hood and all that's included on the bottom. I actually have the, um, what is this called? The spider holster adapter clip that allows me to, to notch this onto the side of my belt. And then just an Arca Swiss. This is just from the Joe B Gorilla Pod. You can use any one you want. And then this works on Arca Swiss and this whole thing then easily holsters to the side of uh, my belt. So that's that's pretty much how I use this when I go about it, is I just have it holstered to the side because it's kind of heavy and I don't like to necessarily hang it from my neck um, all the time. Actually, most of the time I don't like to hang it um, out from the neck as well. I know a lot of people complain about the menu system on a Sony's. I actually like this. This is actually an up-to-date interface, uh, very similar to what they have on the Alpha 9. Again, I keep referring to the Alpha 9. It's a $4,500 camera. Anyway, it's got a similar system with that. But one bad point about that is that if you have Sony Play Memories Home or if you've owned a previous Sony uh, camera and you bought a bunch of in-camera apps right now that's not compatible with this and I don't even know if that's ever going to be ported on this or any other Sony camera moving forward that is going to be using the new interface. So that's something to consider if you have a lot of money invested in that. I know I bought it for the RX10 Mark III and I also bought it for the Sony Alpha 6500. So the time-lapse modes, stop motion, you know, any of those other uh, apps in there, those are the one, the main ones that come to mind. Uh, they're, they're just not available or transferable to this system at this time. So keep that in mind, it might never actually happen uh, again. All right, so let's take a look at see um, what other things uh, that I wanted to share with this. Shooting experience really good. The focusing is amazing. The zoom is super fast. The 4K video footage is excellent. It does pretty well in low light, but then in low light, I actually like to push it down uh, to a uh, lower ISO. I, I shoot all the way up to 3200 and I find that it's okay, but I usually like to keep it at 800 or below. Uh, 24 frames per second burst shooting in JPEG and RAW. You could just shoot like practically forever. Hundreds, hundreds of, of frames, both in RAW and JPEG at the same time. And even when you're shooting in 4K, you want to go ahead and make it a little bit easier to edit on your editor or any editing program that you have. Uh, it actually records proxy files in 720p, so you can just do your editing, your previews in the already 720p, and then output the whole thing in 4K later. Uh, I won't get into technical details in that, but that's that's pretty huge and also useful because when you're shooting in 4K, you bring it to an old laptop like I have right now on the MacBook uh, Pro right now, first gen, it's so slow. So anyway, so so that that's something that's really nice. It's got Bluetooth like before, Bluetooth functionality, what I, which I use for geotagging. So whenever you have your cell phone, it uses Bluetooth low energy, so it'll geotag the photos for you if you want to. You can turn on the location linking. 
that's actually useful when you're out uh, traveling. So this is the best travel camera that I can think of, best all-in-one. Uh, let's see, what other key features should we take a look at? Well, compared to the FZ, uh, Panasonic FZ2500, of course, this is way more expensive, but you get so much more out of it. The FC2500 has, has a built-in ND filter. That's the only other main thing that I can think of. And it's also a lot cheaper. And it's also lighter weight by a bit. Yeah, I absolutely love this camera. I highly recommend that you consider it. Um, I bought this from B&H Photo. Uh, not sponsored by B&H Photo. And I bought it used. So I recommend that you check to see if there are any great condition ones used uh, from B&H Photo, because you can save yourself a lot of money there. If you're gonna buy a new, please use my links down below to uh, Amazon. And of course you got the whole full on 30 days to go ahead and try it out and, and use it. Uh, one other thing that I don't particularly like about this is that the buttons feel a little bit mushier for something in this price range at $1,700. I wish that they updated the body a little bit more. And that's just generally in comparison with a pro class camera, but perfectly fine for a bridge camera. Uh, bridge meaning it, it uh, typically you don't have interchangeable lenses uh, on, on, on the system. So, Oh, one other accessory I recommend is to go ahead and get the uh, battery charger. There are two of them uh, available that I'm going to recommend. One is the RAV Power and the other one is the Night Core, but uh, I have a review pending on that one. So that's another thing I'm going to link down below that you can consider uh, getting as a, as a pretty good accessory to go with your RX10 uh, Mark IV. Let me think about it, see if there's anything else I can think of. No, other than that, you are ready to go with amazing results. It handles extremely well. The build name stabilization is just amazing. I have an example shot up at, that I shot up at the top of a Ferris wheel uh, while it's moving and shaking in the wind of a cruise liner at 600 millimeters away. I posted that on my Instagram. Uh, you can check that out. I'll also have a link down below on that. You'll see some footage from there. Just absolutely amazing. Definitely would not be able to have gotten that shot with a DSLR or a mirrorless with a gigantic lens. There's just no way I could have handheld that. And the results look amazing. This was right at sunset as well. Again, I, I just so impressed with this camera. It is so impressive that if I, you know, if I had to start over and I didn't buy all this other Sony gear, I didn't buy all this other Fuji gear, didn't buy all this Canon gear, Olympus and Panasonic gear, and doing what I do now and even, even I would just buy this camera alone for 90 some percent of the things that I do. Now, I love my, my Fuji, which is a fixed focus, the X100F, but really honestly, since I got this and since I've been out traveling, and if I go out, this is the only camera I bring. If I pair this up with the Sony RX100 Mark V, that is $1,000, that's really pricey. Then I would just basically have the best of both worlds. I got the pocketability, super fast autofocus and, and high quality in a pocketable design. But then I got the RX10 uh, Mark IV for just the amazing range up to 600 millimeters. If you were to go out on a safari, you know, you go whale watching, um, out with family, taking pictures of kids, and you would just want to have that, that crisp, clear locking focus. Man, this, this just works just about for everything. The only other areas that, uh, that I would consider not getting this is if you only shoot at night in the dark, maybe in the bars or something with available light, like really dark available light. And uh, you, you know, you can't use flash or external lighting. That's when you gotta go for the bigger sensors. There's really no way around that. In that case, you're, you're gonna spend a lot of money and you're not gonna get the range, of course. You're gonna get an A7, A7S uh, Mark II or Mark III when it comes out and you're gonna shoot full frame. And it's, it's gonna be you know, a lot more cumbersome if you wanna cover the range and you simply can't. Um, another thing I should mention too is that even though this is f2.4, which is not the fastest lens in the world, but given the range that the Alpha 6500 covers, uh, that's gonna be the equivalent of, I believe someone did some numbers on there. I wish um, I had that handy, but if you're looking at full frame equivalent, you're not gonna get super amount of bokeh the way you can, obviously with a bigger sensor. So you're gonna be looking at equivalent of like six, 
like an F6 starting out, like F5 or F6 something starting out um, at the 2.4 range. But obviously when you zoom in at a focal range, you know, I'll share some examples of some pictures that took over here in national parks out here. Uh, Red Rock Canyon, for instance, you'll see that you still get a nice bokeh, but uh, obviously you're not gonna get anywhere like that unless you zoom in on it. And since you got the zoom range, you can easily achieve that as well. Close macro focusing actually does pretty well. Uh, I believe it focuses as close as three centimeters on the wide end and, and a bit further on the, obviously on the long end is like 32, 32 centimeters, something like that. Uh, but it actually actually works out pretty well too. So if you're doing some product shots of, of something close up or macro shots, uh, this is fairly satisfying, especially with the depth of field, you know, it helps to keep everything in focus. Uh, that's one of the benefits of using a small size sensor. Oh, another thing is obviously you want to buy some additional batteries. Again, I've got reviews on the best batteries. This is completely interchangeable with the Alpha 6500. And so it works out well that way. Now, another thing uh, that a lot of pros are going to like about the, uh, uh, the video capabilities too, is that this also records in S-Log, which, which is just a nice tonal range that allows you to adjust the colors with, with a, a much more range. Um, than you can. That's typically only found on more expensive or video focused uh, features on, on, on cameras. So this works extremely well as a hybrid shooting photography and video side. It's just got a little bit of a crop when it's shooting in 4K. So crops in just a little bit, uh, not enough to be super annoying like you would find on even let's say the Canon 1DX Mark uh, I, I even forgot what it was, well, 1DX, 1DX Mark II. That thing is incredibly cropped up. So this has just a little bit of a crop. It's, it's not too bad, it's there, but it's not as crazy as a lot of these other cameras uh, that I have. So the other question is, well, if you are already invested in a bunch of other systems, um, should you even get this? Yeah, actually, you should get it. You should try it out. If you find it, you're never shooting with the other stuff. You might consider selling all that other equipment. Just <laughs> you just do it. Put all that money aside and maybe save up for the next version because it's going to be more expensive or get all the accessories you want. Or better yet, just spend that money on experiences and travel and vacation or if you really want to get super serious about photography or videos, you know, spend that money on some classes. You're, you're much better off than having all this other gear with all the uh, interchangeable lenses of, of all these other, other cameras and having to fuss with that and carry more stuff. I'm finding definitely when I'm traveling, I mean, I, I got like four bags with me. Of, of course, um, a lot of it's camera gear, a lot of it's, you know, to record these videos on YouTube as I'm about, but I mean, that, that's a lot of gear. Being able to knock it down to one camera is, is really nice. Yeah. So again, I highly recommend the Sony RX10 Mark IV. I've had it for about two months right now. Um, since I, again, since I got, I haven't touched any of these other uh, cameras that much, except when I needed to shoot some stuff for 4K. Uh, please uh, like and subscribe. To, uh, please like this video if you like it. If you didn't like it, you know I'm sorry. But if you if you feel like there's some other ways I can improve on it, um, please comment down below. Please share this video and please subscribe for more. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I'm trying to hit the 1,000 subscriber mark by February 20th. And I'm still really short, so I could really use your help on, on, on that, everybody, including you, uh, the person watching this video. And of course, if you're interested in any of the things I talked about today, please check my links down below uh, in, in the uh, description and in the comments. If you have any questions for me, feel free to, uh, you know, feel free to go ahead and, and ask me down below or on Twitter uh, or Instagram. Um, you'll find that all on my profile on YouTube. Um, I, I really can't think of any really bad areas that this camera would be for in terms of general photography, except for specialized. All right, that's it for this video. I will catch you in the next one. Thanks for watching.